What is the best Star Trek film? Ask your average Trekkie this question, and you are extremely likely to have them answer with The Wrath of Khan. Uh, and it is a damn good movie, no doubt about it. It is a thrilling story of revenge and aging, and mostly holds up to this day. But we don't feel that it is the best Star Trek film. For us, that award goes to Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. This film has it all. Great character work, thrilling conspiracy, action, tension, all without even cracking two hours. It is by a long way the best screenplay in the whole series, and paired with some exceptional exceptional direction, it stays as our favourite Star Trek film of all time. You may have noticed the plural pronouns. Uh, this is not because we are Borg, you will be assimilated. <laughs> uh, this is because joining me for this review, and possibly future Star Trek reviews to come, is my brother and co-composer of this channel's theme song, Declan. Say hello, Declan. Hello! Oh. Hello, uh, editing Michael. Unfortunately, Declan will not be able to be in this video after all. Um, and I'm just too lazy to refilm the intro. <laughs> The year is 1991. After the shit show that was the final frontier, the Star Trek movies really needed a win. The next generation was by now well and truly kicking ass on the small screen, so it was time to retire the crew of the original Enterprise. Several ideas for a new Star Trek movie were thrown around, including a movie about Starfleet Academy, but eventually it was decided to give the original crew one final adventure while also tying the history of the original series directly to the next generation by showing the beginning of the alliance between the Federation and the on Empire. Thus, the undiscovered country is born. However, before we discuss the movie further, a cheeky Patreon plug. The Michael and Lo-Fi Patreon will not only get you early access to my videos, but you will also get an inside look as to the process of making these videos. This includes clips from work in progress videos, stuff that doesn't make the cut of existing videos, audio bloopers, and even the notes I take when watching content for this channel. On top of all that, you'll be able to lodge video requests, so if there's something you'd like me to cover, you can tell me and I will put it on the list. There might also be polls for what you want me to do next? That seems like fun. So not only will you be getting all this, but you'll also be supporting this channel, for which I would be very grateful. So swing by my Patreon. It's a little sparse at the moment, but once I get into the swing of things over there, it'll be much more interesting, hopefully. Call the fire department. We just nuked the building. Uh, we'll do this here this time, uh, so we can get it out of the way and get into picking apart what's important in the movie. Uh, so if you haven't seen this movie, here's your final spoiler warning. But also, if you get spoiled, this movie came out in 1991, so quite frankly, that's on you. <laughs> Well, that's a bit mean. <laughs> in the year 2293, the Klingon Empire is crippled when their homeworld's moon Praxis violently explodes, destroying Kronos' key source of power. With the collapse of the Empire on the horizon, the Klingons call a truce with the Federation and arrange to form an alliance, one that would save the Empire. The Chancellor of the Empire, Gorkon, is summoned to Earth to iron out the details, and Kirk is ordered to escort him, much to his horror. En route, there is an incident, during which two men dressed as Daft Punk beam aboard Gorkon's warbird and massacre the crew. My name is Giovanni Giorgio, but everybody calls me Giorgio. In the violence, Gorkon is assassinated, and Kirk is instantly blamed for it by Gorkon's chief of staff, General Chang. Kirk and Dr. McCoy are arrested in the wake of the assassination and sent up the river in a Klingon hearing, and now Spock has to unravel the true conspiracy to destabilize talks between Earth and Kronos to stop a war that would destroy both sides. In the end, they uncover the conspirators. Gorkon's chief of staff, Chang, Admiral Cartwright of Starfleet, and several of their underlings, including the Vulcan Lieutenant Volaris. They uncover the conspirators just in time, and with the help of Captain Sulu of the Excelsior, manage to thwart their plans for war just in time to save the vital peace negotiations. <laughs> Returning to the director's chair for this movie is Nicholas Meyer, whose last contribution to the series was The Wrath of Khan. It's kind of obvious that he was brought in because of William Shatner's legendary cock-up last movie as a sort of, oh no, the last movie sucked, get in the guy who directed the one that was a smash hit, but I won't complain because the results are worth it. Meyer seems to have improved on everything he did to make Wrath of Khan such an engaging movie, keeping the movie going at a pretty good pace for the most part. Though, like Wrath of Khan, it does noticeably slow down in the middle and then suddenly picks up for the 
finale, but it works a little more for me here because the slower middle act makes for some really great moments. Maya also subscribes to the less is more mentality of showing Star Trek shenanigans, the best example of which is the mind meld torture scene towards the end. The whole scene is just a single camera circling Spock and Valaris with nothing but a heartbeat in the background, allowing Leonard Nimoy and Kim Cattrall to carry the scene. It's an incredible moment and definitely one of the scarier moments in a Star Trek movie ever. Maya also uses translation conventions in very interesting ways throughout this movie. There's a bit of a jarring one in a scene where we hear Klingon speaking in Klingon for a minute before switching to perfect English for the benefit of the audience, but later during the trial there's a great moment where we hear Chang speaking Klingon, then cut to the translators translating his speech for Kirk's benefit, then back to Chang yelling in English. It's an excellent piece of directing, explaining the film's shorthand to the audience so they don't get lost. I kinda love it. The set design of this movie is also pretty good. After the butt ass that was the bridge in the final frontier, it's gotten to spruce up with some better lights and a competent filming crew, and this design actually looks like the bridge of a high-tech starship from the future. Except for the 8-bit digital clocks on every display, but I suppose those look cool in 1991. And they also got rid of that fucking carpet from the final frontier. Yeah, I'm still mad about that carpet. We also actually get to see more of the ship. We get to see the quarters of the crew, more engineering, and a little eating place where Scotty gets to be useful while looking at a colouring in page of the Enterprise. There's also the galley, where Valaris gets to be useful, if only just to make Chekhov look bad at his job for a minute. How did you not know about the phaser authorization thing, Pavel? You're the head of security. However, there is a fair amount of set redressing going on too. Engineering is a pretty obvious redress of the Enterprise D's engineering section, and the President's office is a much better disguised redress of 10 forward from the next generation. But hey, when you're given like two bucks for set design, every penny saved counts, I guess. The visual effects of this movie are mostly pretty good. In fact, the models for the Enterprise, the Excelsior, and Katinga class have not looked better in any other movie. That said, this movie also has some experiments with CGI which don't always work. Iconic as the massacre on Kronos 1 is, the blood bubbles are pretty fake. It's also worth noting that the violet hue of the Klingon blood was not actually Nicholas Meyer's idea, but a compromise. Meyer originally wanted the blood to be red, as Klingon blood has otherwise been shown to be, but it was a given that doing it this way would put this movie on a fast track to an R rating, so a different colour was chosen to avoid that. It is then a testament to the makeup department for making Chancellor Gorkon's open wounds still look convincing despite the neon hue of his blood. <laughs> Instead of any of the regulars of the Star Trek soundtracks like Jerry Goldsmith or Dennis McCarthy, Maya brought in composer Cliff Edelman for this movie, and he was an outstanding choice for this film. Edelman was told to do something different from the previous scores of the series, and the result is a score that is much darker than anything that had come before it in the series. The best example of this is the overture that plays over the title sequence. It sounds a lot less like a Star Trek score and more like something from a war movie which I suppose this movie is in some ways. At any rate, it's extremely different from the upbeat overtures we've had in previous movies like The Voyage Home, and sets the tone perfectly for the movie to come. And yes, it borrows pretty heavily from Mars the Bringer of War from Gustav Holst's The Planets, <laughs> but hey, composers borrow from classical music all the time, so I don't mind. However, it's not all dark. The final track in the score that accompanies the original crew's sign-off is a lot more upbeat, but it doesn't feel at odds with the rest of the movie, a bit like a light at the end of the tunnel. It is an incredible piece, playing perfectly the emotion of looking back at this nearly 30 year long journey we've been on with these characters. Yeah, this is just a damn good score, and I find it a little overlooked in the Trek music canon. I kinda wish that Eidelman had done a bit more soundtrack work for Star Trek. Having that darker edge to the soundtrack would have made the score for First Contact even better, though we would have lost Goldsmith's awesome overture. Hmm. From here on in, we will mostly be discussing the screenplay of the story. Our thoughts will be organized into little sections to do with the themes, characters, and events of the movie, but it seems useful to give a general impression of the strengths of this script as a whole. If I were to sum up this script in one word, it would be smart. Even more so than a lot of Star Trek films, this screenplay is very intelligently written. For a start, the character work in this movie is probably the best it's been in the Star Trek film franchise in a while. We will get more into the characters as we go along, but off the bat there's been a vast improvement over the incredibly shoddy character writing of the previous film. It's an instant indicator that a lot more care was put into this movie than was in The Final Frontier, and it's a welcome change of pace. Even the less focused on characters on the bridge have moments that call back to character traits established 
established in the original TV show. I speak particularly of Chekhov, whose penchant for complaining and claiming everything under the sun is Russian is well and truly in display here. You know anything about a radiation surge? Sir? Chekhov? Only the size of my head. Perhaps you know Russian epic. There is also an exceptional use of foreshadowing in this movie. There are the more obvious ones, such as Kirk's ill-chosen words and his captain's log coming back to bite him in the ass during the Klingon trial. But then there's the more subtle stuff. My favourite example of this is right after the Klingons have been beamed off the Enterprise, where Valaris scolds two crewmen for gossiping. At that moment, it seems little more than a senior officer setting junior crewmen in their place, but there's still a mildly ominous tone about it. Once the conspiracy for the execution of Gorkon comes to life, it serves as a clue hidden in plain sight as to who carried out the attack. It's just really neat work. Now, this isn't to say this is a perfect script, as there is one scene in the movie that, while hilarious, does annoy me a little. This is later in the movie, when the Enterprise is trying to sneak past a Klingon outpost under the guise of being a Klingon cargo crew. Because of current tensions, they can't use the Universal Translator because the communications banks would detect it. This leads to Uhura trying to speak Klingon herself and doing it very badly, but getting away with it entirely because the Klingon outpost is under the impression that she is drunk. Now, is this scene funny? Yes. It is. Lines like, we is condemning foods, things, and supplies are in fact hilarious, but it does come at the cost of screwing Ahura's character. We all know full and damn well that Ahura is a language expert. It's literally her job. So the sheer concept that she can't speak Klingon without the aid of a book is frankly insulting. You could have still done this joke if you wanted to by having her do it without the book, but stating that her Klingon is a little rusty, leading to some slipped words. And yet this is what we got. Hey, Ohura gets treated well in a Star Trek movie challenge? I mean, I guess it's better than the fan dance in the last movie, so I'll take what we get. There is also some padding at work in the Ruapente scenes. Now, in some ways, this was unavoidable, as Kirk and McCoy's situation on the prison mood needed to be emphasized as being as dire as it is. However, the shapeshifter does push the Ruapente scenes towards campiness, and the moment where Kirk fights the shapeshifter while it's disguised as him is a little silly. But overall, these small nitpicks don't really detract from the quality of the script as a whole, and it can be argued that the shapeshifter puts a little levity into the rather dark proceedings. However, this is all that can be noted in quick little notes, so let's break this script down in more detail. It's right, Jim, but not as we know it. Not as we know it. This movie for me has the most interesting character work on Spock yet. While he had some brilliant character moments over the previous movies, to me, this version of Spock feels like the ultimate culmination of his character far more than his appearances on The Next Generation could ever be. While he's still the deadpan Vulcan we've come to know and love, he seems far more in touch with his human side than he ever has, which is a welcome change from his overly robotic appearance in The Final Frontier, and feels like a way more logical place to take his character after his death. I mean, at the end of the voyage home, he says, I feel fine, teeing us up for a more emotionally connected Spock, but then the final frontier blew ass and didn't follow that up. So it's good to see them get around to it here. So what is the end point of this evolution for Spock? We find that he's come to a philosophy that combines his Vulcan heritage with a connection with his emotions. In the beginning of the movie, he chastises Valaris for focusing her philosophy solely on logic. Logic. It is the beginning of wisdom, Polaris. Obviously, he does not abandon logic. This would be out of character for Spock, but he applies it in a different way. Now, logic informs his actions, but does not solely dictate them. This is a massive growth from where he began in the original series, and it demonstrates just how much he has learned from his experience with humans just as Kirk has learned a lot from him. If anything represents this new incorporation of logic and emotion into Spock's personal philosophy, it's his decision to investigate the murder of Gorkon on his own terms rather than turn back to Starfleet for help. Logically, he rationalizes it well, that any return to Starfleet would give the conspirators a way to hide their tracks, but it is also a decision driven by emotion. Towards the end of the film, he and Kirk discuss their failings on the mission, where Spock says that he was so set on brokering peace, he didn't stop to consider the consequences. So when Kirk was directly stuck in those consequences, it would seem Spock took a bit of the blame for him being in trouble. After all, it would have never happened if he hadn't made Kirk volunteer. Thus, both a loyalty to Kirk and a sense of guilt for getting him to this mess 
drives him to solve the case as quickly as possible so that he can make things right. When he comes to the conclusion that a cloaked Klingon bird of prey fired on Kronos 1, he acknowledges that he is going out on a limb in an attempt to clear Kirk's name. But he does it anyway, not just because of the need to investigate the truth, but because his friend is in danger. Another fun sign of Spock's character development is how quickly he takes to the idea of subterfuge. As he is going against Starfleet in order to clear Kirk's name, everything he does needs to be off the record. This leads to one of my favorite Spock moments ever, where he gets Scotty to say that the warp engines are fried, so he isn't technically lying when he tells Starfleet that his engineering team says that the engines are buggered. A lie? An error. It's a masterstroke of a move, and it's one that remains iconic to this day. What's also interesting is Spock's student mentor relationship with Lieutenant Valaris. Much like Savick before her, and indeed her role in the movie was originally intended to be filled by Savick, she is a promising Vulcan officer who Spock has taken a personal interest to. Spock intends her to be his replacement in Starfleet, and through the movie it seems that Valaris intends to use this relationship to throw Spock off the scent in terms of his investigation into the conspiracy. But the trouble is, Spock sees right through her. The movie doesn't make it explicit when Spock realizes she is one of the conspirators, but his actions throughout point to him working it out early. He keeps Valaris by his side throughout the investigation. He claims it's so she can help, but it's plain it's because he wants to keep an eye on her. When Kirk's log is read out in the courtroom, he shoots Valaris a dark look. If he wasn't sure before, he seems to be certain now. But it seems that part of him really hoped that this wasn't the case. When Valaris is caught in the sickbay, Spock is enraged. He might have known all along, but he seemed to have been hoping against hope it wasn't true. But when it was obvious that it was her, the betrayal clearly drove him to rage. All of this leads to probably the worst thing Spock ever does to another person in his tenure in Starfleet, the forced mind meld with Valaris. On the one hand, it seems they don't have a choice, as they needed to know who else was in the conspiracy and where the conference was to take place as fast as possible. But not only is a forced mind meld well on record as being a form of torture, but Spock's rage at Valaris no doubt made that action a lot more violent. In his fury and desperation, Spock nearly shreds Valaris' mind, then steps away from her with a look of horror. He understands fully the horror of what he's done, and he's shaken. It's a truly sobering moment, and one that also demonstrates how emotion holds a position in his decision making. Was the mind meld logical, or was it a decision based on anger? It's hard to tell. I want to make some quick notes on Valaris herself, because her character and position in the conspiracy is interesting to me. In the first act, Valaris is clearly meant to be taken at face value, a Vulcan officer who prefers to do things by the book. She came out top of her class, You and, what? and quotes regulations at Kirk when he suggests bending them a little bit. However, the movie quickly begins to unfold little hints that she's not all that she seems. When she breaks the Starfleet regulations on impulse engines and space dock, she admits to have always wanted to try it. She is the one who suggests opening a bottle of Romulan ale for the dinner with Chancellor Gorkon, an illegal beverage in the Federation due to trade embargoes with the Star Empire. Most telling of all, however, she is the first to suggest sabotage to Uhura and Chekhov when they are thinking of ways to get Starfleet off their backs, but when Spock suggests bending the truth, she acts surprised. At first glance, it seems contradictory, but when it's understood that she's one of the conspirators, it makes sense. She behaves differently around different people, in an attempted disguise. She feigns shock at Spock's subterfuge in hopes he considers her a model Vulcan. She suggests sabotage to the crew so she appears as one of them. Moreover, her suggestion of Romulan Ale appears to be in aid of her part in the conspiracy. Romulan Ale is also apparently very strong. I, I don't know who the Romulans are, but those guys know how to party. <laughs> so while the crew's minds were dulled by the drink, their reaction to the attack on Kronos 1 was not as sharp as it might have been otherwise. Now, I want to bring back my note about Valaris nearly being Savick. This would have had some very interesting effects on Savick, obviously, but it's worth looking into why Savick would have betrayed Starfleet in order to instigate a war with the Klingons. The answer seems to be in the search for Spock. Savick was on Genesis when the Klingons killed David and nearly killed Spock. So if she were to have turned on them in this movie, it follows that this would be why. She would have been convinced by this incident that Klingons aren't to be trusted and they should be destroyed. Now, I can understand where the screenwriters were headed here, but the fact of the matter is 
because I think this would have been too far outside Savick's established character to work. Savick is a lot more level-headed than that in The Wrath of Khan and Search for Spock, so I can't really see her taking a step that far into extremism. It's a good thing they canned that idea, and while it's obvious that's where Valaris came from, her mentor-student relationship with a Spock being a clear leftover, overall she works much better for the story being told here. Captain's Log, USS Excelsior. For the most part, it's great to see that Sulu has his own command. He's been serving on the Enterprise for so long after all, so seeing him move on is pretty awesome. It also works well at showing that this phase of history is coming to an end. Not just because the iconic crew has been split up a little bit, but also because of the ship he's the captain of, the Excelsior, a ship that represents the future of Starfleet in these movies. Sulu is also just a really good captain. I like that he's shown to be pretty stern with his crew, but never to the extent of assholery. We have no idea, Location Enterprise. Sir? You have hearing problems, mister. He's also learned from the best in terms of telling the engineers to fuck off when they protest what he's putting the ship through. Come on, come on. She'll fly apart. Fly apart then. The only major problem with the Excelsior subplot I have is a botched Chekhov's gun setup. Or should I say... Sulu's gun. <laughs> At the beginning of the movie, Sulu explains in his exposition, uh, I mean Captain's Log, that the Excelsior has been mapping gaseous anomalies across the sector. And yet when the final battle happens, the Enterprise is the one with the specialized equipment for scanning gaseous anomalies. Now, yes, this does mean we get the bit where Spock and McCoy do surgery on a torpedo, but it would have made a lot more sense for it to play out like this. Sulu and Kirk have an open comm during the battle. This way, we also avoid listening to Chen quote Shakespeare. It occurs to Spock that the Bird of Prey is letting out exhaust, and then Sulu says, Oh shit, we have tech to track gaseous anomalies, that was literally our mission just now. Then Spock can talk Sulu through the process of building the torpedo, and Bob's your uncle, Chang's still fucked. What the fuck? <laughs> Don't believe them. Don't trust them. There is also a lot in this movie about the destructive power of prejudice, which is mostly explored through Captain Kirk's character. While the hostilities of the conspirators are a lot more based on power and holding onto it, Kirk's is based on prejudice, a hate for Klingons he's harbored since the death of his son David, or possibly even longer, but David is the excuse he gives for much of the movie, both to others and to himself. Lesser movies would have portrayed his hatred for the Klingons as totally justified, but here it is shown to be in no way justified. In the beginning of the movie, when Kirk is assigned to escort the Klingons to the peace talks, we get this exchange between Kirk and Spock about it. They're animals, Jim. There is an historic opportunity here. Don't believe them. Don't trust them. They are dying. Let them die. You can't do that. That's racist. This moment seems a little out of character, because it is. And even Spock knows that. The point is that Kirk is now so blinded by his hatred for the Klingons that he will now say things that go against the principles he's upheld for his entire career, even if he doesn't completely mean them. Which it seems he doesn't after saying this, he appears to feel bad about letting that one come out of his mouth. But the major point is that his prejudice goes a long way to make things worse. If he hadn't hated the Klingons so much, the conspiracy likely would not have gotten as far as it did. And every time Kirk hears his hateful words thrown back at him, it's a reminder that these words are destructive, and by the end he's ready to dismantle all that, to begin an era of peace with the Klingons. After a disastrous dinner, Gorkon says to Kirk, If there is to be a brave new world, our generation is going to have the hardest time living in it. Later in the movie, Spock echoes a similar statement, asking if he and Kirk have become so old and rigid as to become basically useless in a new age. By the end of the movie, Kirk seems to have taken those words to heart, wanting to prove them wrong, that he could change, that he could help usher in this new age of peace. And in a way, when he saved Gorkon's daughter Atzibur at Kitima, he did and when he says that his son's faith has been restored, it seems to be less about David and more about Kirk himself finally overcoming the prejudice he'd held on for so long. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this movie is its use of contemporary politics. Star Trek has never strayed away from politics, the Doomsday Machine being an obvious reference to the Cold War for example, but I don't remember a lot of other times where the show took a specific event in contemporary history and used the show to comment on it, except for the Xindi probe in The Expanse being an obvious 9-11 reference. In case it wasn't totally obvious, this movie is about the collapse of the USSR, with the Klingon Empire being the Soviet Union and the Federation 
Revolution taking place of America. The commentary in this movie isn't exactly what you'd call subtle, but it does provide some interesting insight into the feelings at the time on the topic of the dissolution of hostility between the two nations. On the one hand, the movie depicts the New Alliance as a good thing, that the New Alliance could be beneficial to both parties. However, the flip side of the argument is also represented in this movie and is in fact the driving force of the narrative. The idea that the more militant sides of the discussion would much rather work together to destabilize their own governments than give up the power given to them by the constant hostility is a sobering one, but it is perfectly represented through the machinations of Admiral Cartwright and General Chang, who nearly succeed in starting a war together just so their respective fleets are not dismantled. It's a damning indictment of the governments that have been at each other's necks for so long, both in universe and in reality, but ultimately this is an optimistic movie. At the end of the day, after the Machiavellian power trips of those in power trying to maintain the status quo and the violence committed to do so, this movie ends with the Klingons and humans reaching a tentative alliance, demonstrating to the viewer that ultimately peace is possible so long as we not only believe in it, but work for it. There are also a couple of other neat references that tie this movie to the Cold War. Praxis appears to be a reference to Chernobyl, both end up exploding violently due to lack of proper safety precaution, and Chang's line, don't wait for the translation, answer me now, seems to be a reference to an infamous moment in the UN Security Council during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where US Ambassador Stevenson shouted those words almost verbatim at the Soviet ambassador during an argument over missiles in Cuba. Guess who's coming to dinner? One of the best places the political landscape of this movie is laid out is in the dinner scene in the first act. As dialogue heavy scenes in this movie go, and there are a lot of those, this one stands out as the best. It does begin on a mildly lame joke about how the Klingons don't understand humid table manners, ha ha Klingon doesn't know how to use a fork, bottom text, but after that it's nothing short of brilliance if a little on the nose. It begins optimistically enough, as the idea behind the dinner was to foster good relations. Gorkon offers a toast to the new alliance, which he calls the Undiscovered Country. This is, in of itself, an interesting choice on his part, given that in the play he's referencing, Hamlet, the Undiscovered Country is a metaphor for death. So it seems he is signaling that this piece will be the death of the old way, whatever that may bring. If we want to get really deep, we could also pick apart the fact that this is where the name of the movie is derived, as I think it's a metaphor for the past of this era of Star Trek, but I could be reaching, so let's move on. Spock picks up on the Shakespeare reference, leading to a bit of a silly joke about not having experienced Shakespeare unless you read it in the original Klingon. This leads me to believe that there have been at least two translations of the Bard's work into Klingon, and the consensus is the new translation is dog shit, but that's neither here nor there. And then McCoy offers a toast to Gorkon, returning the olive branch that he had extended. So far, everything seems perfectly cordial, but the underlying tension is still there, waiting to come out. This tension is almost immediately brought out by General Chang, who point blank asks if Kirk would be okay with the mothballing of Starfleet, implying that he sees Starfleet as a purely military operation. This places Chang in an antagonistic position in the scene, setting up his conflict with Kirk later in the movie very nicely. Spock attempts to cover for his captain to keep things cordial, but Kirk takes the bait. I believe the captain feels that Starfleet's mission has always been one of peace. Far be it for me to dispute my first officer. Jim, for the love of God. Shut the fuck up! Ohura and Chekhov make their own attempts to keep things mellow, Ohura trying to start idle conversation, and Chekhov trying to diplomatically paint the Federation as the good guys, saying that everyone in the galaxy has human rights. This time, Atsuba speaks up, pointing out the inherent bias in that statement. Human rights. Why, the very name is racist. Federation is no more than a... Homo sapiens only club. Listen, lady, we can't be racist. We have an alien first officer. Am I making this political commentary obvious enough? This is an important moment in this conversation as it makes plain that our heroes are not perfect. While the Federation is generally painted as the good guys, it does not mean they are without their prejudices, small or large. It also sets up Atsuba's character very well, not necessarily antagonistic towards the Federation and willing to go forth with a new piece, but not ready to kiss their asses either. At this point, one of Gorkon's staff posits that the Federation intends to wipe out Klingon culture, taking Atsuba's criticism and twisting it into something else. It is now very clear that the Klingons are as split on the decision to reach out as everyone else. It's interesting to note that of the crew, it's McCoy who reacts to that statement with immediate denial. Neither Kirk nor Spock engage with it. Chang diplomatically explains the Klingon dilemma to Kirk, but instead of understanding, Kirk responds
accounts childishly comparing the Klingon concern for their culture to the Third Reich. Once again, the movie makes no bones about the fact that Kirk was unequivocally wrong to say that, cutting to Spock reacting in muted horror and Chang masking his own shock behind a polite, I beg your pardon? This uncalled for stab is the final nail in the coffin for this dinner, and Gorkon warily observes that the two species have a long way to go before peace is achieved. What I like about the statement is Gorkon doesn't seem bitter about it, just tired. He doesn't resent Kirk for the comment, showing him to be the bigger man in the situation. He is now sitting as the most righteous man in the room, setting him up for the fall he will take very soon. The Klingons being back to Kronos 1, and the crew of the Enterprise retired to their quarters. Here Kirk seems aware he'd acted childishly, casually saying, let me know if there's any other way we can screw up tonight. But he's still not looking his prejudices in the face for what they are, instead blaming alcohol for it, saying no more Romulan ale at functions. But now for the moment where the movie takes a turn, the assassination of Gorkon. At the heart of this movie is the conspiracy to start all-out war between the Federation and the Empire that's spearheaded by both Federation and Klingon parties, and also the Romulans for some reason. Like, what is this Romulan doing on this side of the neutral zone? That aside, the conspiracy at the heart of this movie is extremely well thought out. We already have the political background for everything, so the motivations of the conspirators are also very well thought out. As we said in the section about the politics, the motivations of the characters of this movie are very much a commentary on Cold War politics, and Admiral Cartwright represents the US military. His speech at the beginning of the film about bringing the Empire to its knees is a little on the nose, but it perfectly sets up that he has no interest in these peace talks and would likely be happy to see them fail. General Chang is shown to be a warrior first from the moment he first appears, but the most telling hint to what his plans are are in the scene where Atzba details her plans for moving forward after her father was gunned down. While in the moment we would be forgiven for thinking that Chang's insistence on going to war would be out of revenge for Gorkon's assassination, once we learn he's the one with the bird of prey, it becomes clear that this was simply pretext he could hide behind. And the actual plan is a ridiculously simple one, which is why it fits together so well in the movie. Chang knows that Gorkon is going to earth for the peace talk so he can follow in the bird of prey and cripple Kronos 1. Valaris then doctors the computer transcript so it seems as if the Enterprise fired, then sends her two lackeys to kill Gorkon. And while it seems that killing Atzaba at Kitima wasn't the plan they hoped would come to pass, it seems their hope was that she'd instantly declare war, Cartwright was in place to feed the bird of prey the Kitima location so they could kill her, ensuring the war. As plans go, it's pretty great. Straightforward and perfectly understandable without watching the movie three times. In an extended cut of this movie, however, the plan is a little obfuscated by the presence of Colonel West, played by the ever-brilliant René Aubergenois, sporting a very silly moustache. In his first scene, he's shown pitching the President of the Federation a mission called Operation Retrieve, which would send Federation troops to Kronos to retrieve Kirk and McCoy, possibly starting an interstellar war. It's an interesting scene, but definitely better off left on the cutting room floor, especially given that it would have made more sense to me if Cartwright had pitched the plan, and it contains one of the dumbest lines in Star Trek history. But suppose you precipitate a full-scale war. Then, quite frankly, Mr. President, we can clean their chronometers. <laughs> And then West appears again at the end of the extended version of this movie, where he's revealed to be an assassin at Kitima wearing a Klingon Mission Impossible mask. This scene is best left on the cutting room floor for a couple of reasons. A, it makes the simple plan as stated above needlessly complex, and B, this Mission Impossible face reveal is a fatally stupid moment for an otherwise pretty straight-faced movie. The other thing I appreciate about this movie is that it doesn't make any secret about how hypocritical the conspirators are. When Valaris is brought to the bridge to answer for her part in the conspiracy, everything that comes out of her mouth is contradictory by nature. She tries to place herself on the moral high ground above the Federation she claims to be trying to save, calling those in the Federation looking for peace traitors, but then slags off her co-conspirators saying they conspired with us to kill one of their own, how trustworthy can they be? And yet she still trusts trusted Chang to carry out his part of the conspiracy, which means she trusts him more than the Federation she claims to be helping. Furthermore, it is clear that her appeals to Kirk's history with the Klingons are completely meaningless were. Given that it was Kirk who was to be the scapegoat for the conspiracy, whether Kirk trusts the Klingons or not is 
immaterial to her. It ends up simply being an empty way for her to try and justify her role in this conspiracy to herself and to everyone else. What's most interesting about this to me is it, that we know the original script ideas had Savick in the role of Valaris, so if it had been Savick instead of Valaris, she would have said pretty much the same thing. Except now it wouldn't have been a hollow attempt at self-justification. There, she truly would have meant it due to her experience in The Search for Spock. So that's interesting. Shut up about Shakespeare. Shut up about Shakespeare. Once again, it's it's not a Star Trek film without a compelling villain, unless it's the Voyage Home, but that probe is scary as hell, so that counts. But in this movie, we don't actually know who's orchestrating it until towards the end, which was a really great move. Playing the cards as to who is in charge of the conspiracy too early would have defanged this movie quite a bit, but the mystery of who the Kingpin is drives this movie really well. However, once the villain is revealed to be General Chang, it's not jarring either because of the antagonistic role he played in Kirk and McCoy's trial. It's a really good reveal. However, Chang himself is a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, Christopher Plumer puts in a really great performance and he is written as a genuine menace to the crew of the Enterprise, especially in the trial where he tears Kirk and McCoy apart. On the other hand, however, he really needs to shut the fuck up about Shakespeare. Not a scene goes by where he doesn't quote the bard at Kirk for dramatic purposes. And a lot of the time it doesn't even make sense, like in this bit where he's shooting up the Enterprise and just yells, Cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. Why don't you talk properly? Also, his eye patch is a little much. It's almost as if the character designers were thinking he doesn't look evil enough, actually, and slapped it on to complete the image, which does raise the question of why they felt the need to telegraph him being the leader of the conspiracy by making him look evil, but oh well. <laughs> Equally as important as Chang to the conspiracy is his ship, a modified Klingon bird of prey that can fire while cloaked. For context, in the greater Star Trek canon, it is established that due to power control reasons, it's generally impossible for a ship to fire its weapons and maintain a cloaking shield at the same time. However, one of the major steps in the conspiracy, making it seem as if the Enterprise fired on Gorkon's warbird, entirely relies on a ship that can fire while cloaked. For this reason, Chang's bird of prey is born. Its ability to fire while cloaked basically just chalked up to, well, it just can. This might strike is a bit annoying given that Star Trek has actually been surprisingly consistent about its in-world physics, but the Bird of Prey more than makes up for that in terms of the menace it provides over the Federation. In the climactic battle over Kitama, the location of the peace negotiations, Chang has the upper hand for almost the entire battle. Because he can fire while cloaked, he remains invisible to the Enterprise and the Excelsior, leaving Kirk and Sulu shooting in the dark while Chang leads devastating blow after blow. It gives the final battle an extra level of tension, one that is only a alleviated when Kirk has the idea to track the Bird of Prey's exhaust rather than the ship itself. This also results in Chang's eventual defeat being just that much more satisfying. So while the firing while cloaked mechanism is a massive case of it works because the story needs it to, it does provide more good to the script than bad, so I don't really mind it. This is the end. When this movie was being written, it was understood that this would be the last time we see the crew of the USS Enterprise together. This would be their final stand, and the torch would be passed on in full to the future of Starfleet. So, as a final goodbye to Kirk and his crew, does this movie work? The answer is an unquestionable yes. The thing is, this movie doesn't do the send-off in the way we would expect today. If you look at how massive arcs and stories are wrapped up in general, especially today, you'd expect something completely different from this movie. Such movies today would be massive love lessons to the era it is an end to with tons of references and pieces of fan service that reference the long history of the crew of the Enterprise. As an example, I'll take the third season of Picard. This is clearly written as a final end for the crew of the Enterprise D, looking over the seven run season of the next generation and basing its development on references and fan service. The Enterprise D is brought back for one last mission. The entire iconic crew serve together on one ship one last time. Familiar faces come and go, as do iconic villains. It is a culmination of all the things that are loved about the era of Captain Picard and his intrepid crew. Now this isn't an inherently bad way to write this sort of final send-off story. It served the season of Picard rather well in fact. But it is a trope nonetheless, and one the undiscovered country completely avoids. So how does this movie approach the idea of a send-off? Rather than the goodbye being a summation of all that came before it, this movie explicitly places itself 
in a moment of great change in the timeline of the series. Making the last voyage of the Enterprise into a political drama rather than one last high-octane space adventure might seem odd in the post-Endgame world, but I can think of no better way to send this crew off. We know something big must have happened between the original series and The Next Generation, as not only are the Federation and the Klingon Empire allies, but a Klingon serves on the bridge of a Federation starship. Placing the last adventure of Kirk's crew at that moment of change, the Kitam records that bring the Federation and the Empire closer together is an effective send-off. Things have changed, so now we must say goodbye to this era of Starfleet and the crew we have followed through this era. And this change is well integrated throughout the movie. Right from the beginning, when it's announced that Kronos is reaching out for a peace treaty with the Federation, speculation about everyone's place in this new galaxy is rampant. Gorkon observes that those born into the Federation Klingon conflict will have a hard time adjusting to this new world. At the heart of this movie, is the idea of change. Rather than looking back over everything in the past, it tentatively looks towards the future. This is no better represented by Captain Sulu and his command of the Excelsior. In The Search for Spock, the Excelsior is introduced as a vision of the future of Starfleet, something that will supersede the tenure of the Enterprise. Having a core member of the Enterprise crew go on to captain this new starship not only breaks up the iconic crew, in of itself a symbol of change, but shows that there are still places for the old crew in this new world. They just have to change with the times. And of course, at the end of the movie, the Enterprise Enterprise A is decommissioned, and the crew take her for one last joyride around the universe. Her time is over, and she will soon be replaced by another ship named Enterprise, with her own crew and their own missions. This moment works perfectly. The movie's been signaling that this is the end from the beginning, so when it finally comes, we're sad, but prepared to see our beloved ship and crew bow out for the next generation. And as the credits roll and the signatures of the people who brought this crew to life flash on the screen, Kirk's era is at an end. It's a perfectly bittersweet moment, one that none since have ever been able to truly recapture. As a bow tying off this movie, it couldn't possibly be any better. Most point to Wrath of Khan as the best of all Star Trek films. I find that completely understandable as it's engaging, tense, and filled with Star Trek history. But if you want a film that is pure Star Trek, the politics, the social commentary, the grand scale of the galaxy, Wrath of Khan must take a backseat to this film. Not only do I believe that this film far improves on the writing and direction of everything that came before it, that it's visually the most striking of the original series films. Not only do I believe that the characters, especially Kirk and Spock, are written to perfection here, but in my mind, this movie represents everything that Star Trek represents. The hope for a better future, the drive to create it, and the understanding that this world will take effort to bring to life. That it also succeeds in being a touching, perfect send-off to the crew people have known and loved since 1966 is nothing short of astonishing, and marks it in my mind as the best Star Trek film to date, and in all likelihood, the best that we will ever see.